what I want to start with is let's look at disease as sort of an XY graph. On the x-axis, we have current state of where we actually detect current diseases, and on the y-axis, the invasiveness of the procedure that's actually required to detect a specific disease. So if we look at things like cancer and neurology or neurological uh, diseases, typically those are detected now well after the patient has developed symptoms, far along those stages. Um, if we look at the y-axis, typically the procedures required to detect those specific diseases are typically fairly invasive. For oncology, you might be looking at a tissue biopsy. For neurological diseases, it might be a spinal tap, it might be a CT or an MRI. So the goal, obviously, is to how do we move the detection of these diseases to areas where the sickness is very early on or actually asymptomatic? And how do we also be able to detect these diseases in less invasive manners? Can we detect them with simpler methods than biopsies, spinal taps, CTs, by using blood or saliva or urine? So that brings me to actually tell you a little bit about Quanterix and the Samoa technology. So the technology itself was actually developed uh, at Tufts University here in Boston um, by Dr. David Wall. The technology itself was initially, in his chemistry department, designed to isolate single enzymes to study their kinetic behavior. So they looked for a platform that would allow them to isolate those single enzymes and look at the turnovers. And what they came up with was a technology that caused them to bind those single enzymes to beads and then isolate those beads in small microwells to then be able to look at the turnover. From this technology, Quanterix was founded in around 2006, and formally commercialized in 2015 with the release of instrumentation and commercial kits. So how does the technology work? How is it different than what people do today in terms of biomarker research as far as normal immunoassays or ELISAs? If we look at traditional methods of, let's just say, ELISAs for immunoassay detection, those are typically based on antibody capture onto the bottom of the plate and the detection through fluorescent, luminescent, or color metric techniques. In most cases, what's limiting the ability to measure low amounts of that is that the signal that's being generated by the reporter readout is actually diluted and diffuses within the volume of the assay that you're trying to run it in. And therefore, you need a certain level of production of that signal to get above the analytical sensitivity of the instrument you're trying to measure it with, typically a plate reader. For those who are as old as I am, I will uh, relate this to the rotary phone. So what Samoa does is actually take this rotary phone, older technology, and actually digitize it, the iPhone. What it's doing is it's not using unique antibodies. It's not using unique immunoassay capture methods. What it's actually doing is using the same methodology, but using those antibodies or detection in a different way. Instead of binding antibodies to the bottom of the plate, we're capturing those antibodies on beads. That in and of itself is not unique. There are other techniques that use bead capture for immunoassays. The unique part is actually taking those beads back to what Dr. Walt had done in the Tufts University lab, and that's isolating those immunoassays on beads in small wells. And what that does is instead of having a assay volume on the order of microliters, the reaction or the detection is now on the, in a volume on the order of femtoliter volume. Therefore, when that reporter readout, that enzyme that's now being used as the detection entity of the immunoassay, actually does not have to produce much signal to get above the analytical sensitivity of the instrument. And therefore, it allows us to achieve greater sensitivity because instead of the signal being diluted in larger volumes, we're isolating that immunoassay in a very small volume and therefore being able to pick up that uh, detection much easier. So how does it work? 
The immunoassay formation is actually very similar to what irregular ELISA is. Again, with the context that that immunoassay is being built out on a bead instead of being built out on a solid surface microblade. So we're mixing sample with beads. Those beads are covered with a lot of detection entity, in this case depicted as antibodies. We build out the sandwich immunoassay with a detection antibody that's biotinylated. And the reporter readout in this case is a streptavidin beta gal conjugate. So when we build out the fill immunoassay, we have a bead with the capture antibody, the analyte of interest, the detection antibody, and then the reporter readout. From that point, we take those beads and we put them over an array. So we resuspend them in the substrate for the reporter and we put them over an array. This array again contains those very small microwells on the order of 50 femtoliters in volume. And those wells are small enough to enable the capture of a single bead within them. We then image those wells looking for the production of fluorescent signal. We quantitate the images, or we analyze the images, we quantitate them and report back the readout of the biomarker of interest compared to a typical standard curve. The platform itself is extremely flexible. The examples that I will show and have shown typically rely on two antibodies capturing the analyte of interest, but the assay technology platform is sensitive and flexible enough to allow for other immunoassay capture strategies. Depicted on the left is actually a strategy where an antibody was coded onto the bead, but instead of using a second antibody for detection, in this case, they used a biotinylated aptamer, an aptamer that was specific for the target of interest, but that aptamer was biotinylated. So the same sort of reporter readout could be used for detection as was with two antibodies. On the right-hand side is actually the strategy when the molecule of interest is too small to allow for two antibodies or two detection entities to actually bind to it. And in this case, it was set up as a competition format. So in this particular case, the analyte of interest was actually directly conjugated to the reporter enzyme. When the exogenous analyte from the sample was added, it would compete for binding of this to the antibody and decrease the signal that was actually being produced in the readout. Another way in which technology is extremely flexible is sample types that are amenable to being used with it. Probably 75 to 80 percent of the assays that are currently run using the technology are based on serum or plasma. In the neurology context, there are also a lot of ones being used using the cerebral spinal fluid. But remember that the technology is not just for neurology, it's used in other therapeutic areas as well. So, cell lysates, tissue extracts, are amenable to it. Things as uh, odd as tears in saliva. And then if you look at actually in the infectious disease area, stool is actually a very common uh, sample format or sample type that's being used with the technology platform. So if we talk about where this has actually been used, um, to date there are 400 plus publications. Remember, the platform was actually commercialized in 2015. Um, that span is Publications span a broad range of therapeutic areas, including neurology, cardiology, oncology, inflammatory diseases, and infectious diseases. But since we're in a neurology session right here, let's focus strictly on neurology. Of those 400, more than 200 of them are actually in the neurology space, including those in Alzheimer's, traumatic brain injury, and multiple sclerosis. But if you look at other neurological diseases, including Parkinson's, Huntington's, ALS, dementia, um, there are plenty of publications within that realm as well. And there are a number of different neurological biomarkers that have been looked at, including neurofilament light, referred to here as NFL, tau, phospho-tau, and tau variants, that typical A-beta, A-beta 40 and 42, GFAP, and other neurological markers. So one big question going many years back was, could you actually measure neuronal markers in blood? Did those markers actually cross the blood-brain barrier from the cerebral spinal fluid? Uh, for many years, that was always a question. And the question was, really, they were probably there, but the techniques being used weren't sensitive enough to measure them. So let's look at a 
publication from a few years back that actually looked at matched patient plasma or serum against CSF in the same patients. And what these uh, researchers did is look at three different technology platforms. Your old rotary phone ELISA, a more advanced ECL type assay, and then the Samoa technology. What they did is measure both CSF and plasma um, amongst these patients and look at how well they correlated. So if you look on the left, you can see that it's actually quite easy to measure neurofilament light in this case. In cerebral spinal fluid, it's present in the hundreds to thousands of picograms per ml. And all three technologies are easily capable of measuring that. So when it comes to measuring this particular biomarker in serum, that becomes the problem. If you look on the far left with the ELISA, you can measure uh, plasma, or in this case serum, NFL until about 78 picograms per ml, at which point their detection limit prevents them from measuring anything lower than that. If you move to the ECL assay, it is better. It's about five times better than the common ELISA, but again, it reaches a sensitivity limit of about 15 or 16 picograms per ml. When they actually moved it to the Samoa platform, they reached a sub-picogram per ml sensitivity. And what's more important than that is that when you actually looked at the number of patients, serum NFL samples that they measured, all of them were above the limit of detection, meaning not only could you measure diseased samples, but you could actually measure every healthy sample. So if we go back to that original XY graph, one of the objectives was could we measure biomarkers in serum and could we measure them in healthy as well as diseased patients? And the answer to this, based off this, is yes, we can now measure things in serum and blood, these neuronal biomarkers, at much greater sensitivity than current techniques. But what about other methodologies? So we looked at cerebral spinal fluid. What about another neurological disease? or in the case of this TBI slash concussion. The typical methods used for that detection are rely on CT or MRI. So in this particular example, uh, four different neuronal markers, tau, neurofilament light, GFAT, UCHL1, were looked at in both healthy controls as well as subjects that suspected that they had a mild traumatic brain injury or a concussion. And they looked at this by both CT as well as the Samoa technology. And what you can see for, in this particular case, tau is that the controls very well clustered, pretty tight. If you looked at subjects that were both CT and MRI negative, or CT positive, MRI negative, or both CT, MR positive, you can see that there's a much broader spread of all of four biomarkers. What's interesting is that in the groups where, where CT negative and MRI negative, you can definitely see much greater sensitivity to look at these biomarkers and changes in these biomarkers, whereas the common technology was unable to pick those up and able to discriminate them between healthy controls. So this is another example where blood biomarker measurement is actually, in this case, more sensitive than CT or MRI, the traditional methods, for picking up things earlier and or more sensitive. We talked about neuronal markers. What about, as the previous speakers have spoken to, what about neuroinflammation? So neuroinflammation is a very uh, hot area of research. In this particular example, again, going back to a TBI, or traumatic brain injury model, could they pick up differences in inflammatory markers within the blood to discriminate controls from TBI patients. Um, the upper panels look at two inflammatory markers, IL-6, TNF-alpha, and they could definitely discriminate control patients from TBI patients. And you're looking at changes of, on the order of single digit picogram per ml in the blood. In addition, this particular group was further subdivided into PTSD, both high and low suspected PTSD, and in those subpopulations, again, they could see patient, the ability to discriminate patients from each other 
based on pro-inflammatory markers, both IL-6 and TNF alpha. So one final example is, can we start to see some of these neurodegenerative diseases earlier? So this goes back to the x-axis on that original graph. Right now we're predicting we can actually detect them later on. Are we actually able to see them pre-symptomatic? So this very recent publication from earlier this year looked at a population that was predisposed to Alzheimer's. So they carried a mutational uh, mutation in either the APP, PSCN1, or PSCN2 gene that predisposed them to Alzheimer's. And this particular group looked at serum NFL levels, again, neurofilament light. And if they looked at baseline levels, between those groups, they were actually able to see about seven years before the estimated onset, they were able to discriminate those two groups. However, if they then looked at the rate of change per year of the serum NFL concentration between those individual patients, they could actually now, instead of seven years, predict which ones we're going to get, they could actually see 16 years before the development of Alzheimer's, which group was actually going to uh, get Alzheimer's disease. So an improvement of about nine years by looking at small rates of change on the order of one to two picograms per ml rates of change, um, the ability to now discriminate those patients that had a predisposition to Alzheimer's from those that did not. So if we go back to that original graph, Remember that the goal was to actually, could we now start to utilize technologies where we can move the detection of degenerative diseases, neurodegenerative, oncology, et cetera, could we move them earlier on the x-axis to now be able to pick them up in an asymptomatic manner, as well as could we start to see the ability to measure these biomarkers of interest in less invasive manners. And what I hope that I've shown you over the past 15 to 20 minutes is that, at least for the case of Samoa, we have shown, and customers, researchers have shown the ability to now be able to see things earlier detection-wise, as well as be able to measure some of these biomarkers in less invasive manners. And hopefully this will continue. Um, right now, the technology is being used for research only, but the hope is, is that this down the road will be able to be used in a diagnostic fashion as well. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have on Quanterix, the technology, and how it's been used. Thank you.